Heaven. Oh, my goodness. All I can say is that my, uh, uh, about my career as a professional musician and as an author of operating systems is that my reputation exceeds me. <laughs> I made that up. I was so proud of that joke. And then I Googled it, and somebody else had already made it up. <laughs> Originality's dead. It's so sad. Anyway, well, um, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, Aaron Patterson Memorial closing keynote. <laughs> and um, it's an honor, a naming honor usually reserved for dead people. So that's something. <laughs> and to be invited to present after an introduction like Evans and, and then Aaron's is um, really horrendous. So <laughs> genesis of this talk. This talk started one day my wife Cindy and I were talking and um, I had to do a talk, and I picked out some really nice, safe, technical topic. And uh, I kind of said, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be funny if I talked about how uncomfortable I feel at work most of the time? But you know, I couldn't talk about that. And she said, uh, I dare you <laughs> to talk about that. I said, no, no, no seriously, this, this technical topic, I mean, it wasn't even as good as null objects. That was an awesome talk, by the way, if you didn't see Sandy's talk. <laughs> Killer. <laughs> Page three of the speaker's manual, pander to the previous speakers. <laughs> no, seriously, that was just a, that's, that's all you need to know about object-oriented design in one easily digestible hour, so. But back to my story, my wife had just dared me to talk about how uncomfortable I feel at work, and I had explained that, no, no, I had a really nice technical topic picked out, and she double dared me. <laughs> what are you gonna do? So I said, okay, okay, we'll do it. So this is, this is the talk, it's called Ease at Work. And, um, Since it's late at the end of the conference, I figured I'd put the TLDR right at the beginning. This is really what this boils down to. Please pardon Mark for the sexist language. We haven't even figured out better pronouns than this, but um, a man cannot be com comfortable without his own approval. And I think that's really what all this comes down to. So if you need to go to sleep now, you're fine. It's dark, I won't be able to see you. The people next to you, nah, they're probably going to be asleep too, so don't worry about that. Okay, so story, first half of the story. Again, please pardon the sexist language. This is how I learned the story, and I haven't figured out a better way to tell it. A farmer needs some help, and he, uh, he interviews a number of uh, different farm helpers, potential farm helpers. And one young man catches his eye. The young man says, I can sleep when the wind blows. And the farmer's like, what? You can sleep when the wind blows. What does that even mean? But the young man looked eager, strong, like he could do the work, so the farmer hires him. Now you gotta wait the whole rest of the presentation for the second half of that story. <laughs> the things you can do when you have the clicker. Okay, so ease is not the perfect word for what I'm trying to talk about. Remember I said, I feel uncomfortable oftentimes at work. But one of my mental habits is always expressing things in the positive. So I'm looking for the word and uh, 
the, this word ease came to my mind. But there's some, some parts of the meaning that I really, this is not what I mean. I don't mean that you risk nothing at work. That's not what I'm trying to achieve. Uh, I certainly don't mean that I don't work hard. I love working hard. I love getting into a technical topic and having a naughty programming problem and pounding away on it and drinking more coffee and being really focused and finally giving up in disgust, walking out the door of my office and going, ah, that was it, turning around, going back in, finishing it. Oh, I'm exhausted, but I feel so satisfied. So I'm not talking about ease like, oh, laying back in a, in a lounge. And I'm not talking about freedom from financial difficulty. These are all dictionary, parts of the dictionary definition of the word ease. And that's not what I'm trying to get at. Here's what I'm trying to get at. This is what I want at work. I want this state of comfort in the sense that I'm where I should be, doing what I should be, that uh, I'm free from this, this nagging feeling that always is in the back of my mind that I really ought to be doing something else. If I'm programming, I'm sh I should be writing, and if I'm writing, I should be coaching, and if I'm coaching, I should be up shoveling out the goats. And, and that's such a waste of time Somehow, that's where I spend a big part of my working day, though. So I want that state of comfort. I am where I should be doing, who I should be doing what I should be doing. Second sense of ease, that's what I'm talking about, where I'm pointing, what I'm trying to get to, is uh, freedom from agitation. The programmer's life can be filled with anxiety, and I've certainly had my share. And uh, I heard a, a courageous lightning talk yesterday. Somebody who stood up and said, hey, I suffer from this too. Uh, you know, you're not alone. Well, you're not alone either. This is part of like, oh, uh, is this really going to work? Can I do this? Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Doggone it, do people like me? <laughs> that's, that's part of, of what goes into my, my daily work. And it doesn't really help, but again, it, it's, it's become kind of a habit. And the last sense of ease, and this is one that I love when I have it, is this feeling of facility. There are some athletes that make it look effortless. And it could be a, a, a football player, a basketball player, a race car driver. There are people, there's just no extra motion in, in what they're doing. I remember one of the most striking examples was at a barbecue joint. The, the chef was this gigantic guy pouring sweat in a, in a sweat-soaked t-shirt but watching him was like watching ballet. He was so precise in his moment, movements that he looked like he was hardly doing anything until you notice how much food was coming out. And, and the one that just got me was the way he popped baked potatoes. Because he'd get a baked potato out and he'd take the inside edge of the knife and just go poof and the baked potato was cooked perfectly and so it would just go poof like a flower. Every time exactly the same motion I just thought wow if I could only program with that level of facility. Uh, that's something that I aspire to. That's something when I have it when I'm using a tool that I really understand well on a team that I have strong relationships with, wow, it's just, it's just magical. It's like the hours that I spend there don't even count against my total because it, uh, you know, you just look up and it's hours later and you've done something amazing. So I aspire to that level of facility. Now getting there is really hard work. 
But once you're there, boy, that just feels so good. And practically speaking, uh, you get a lot accomplished. So as I said, in my life, this has not been my experience. For a wide variety of reasons, uh, none of which are germane to this presentation, that's not who I was when I got to 23 and entered the workforce. I was quite the opposite of ease. And over the past, I would say 10 years that I've actively been working on attaining a sense of ease in what I do, I've found a handful of things that really make a difference. And so that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. This is what I do to attain that sense of ease in the, in the, the positive sense that I was talking about of, of uh, uh, facility and comfort and freedom from anxiety. One of the big minuses of the virtual world that programmers live in is you can't touch what we do. W one magnet could destroy my life's work <laughs> if applied intelligently. <laughs> and, uh, and that always seems, it was so different. I remember I was driving around with a contractor and the, uh, in our little town in southern Oregon, the contractor says, oh yeah, I built that house, and I built that office building, and I built that restaurant, and I'm just, ah, I was so jealous. Like, you know, when you send a message on Facebook, that goes through code I wrote. <laughs> Unless somebody's rewritten it since then. <laughs> Twice, <laughs> Colin, if you ever see this. Anyway, so the, the, the challenge here, it, did, did my contractor friend know that his work mattered? Sure, he could just point to examples of people living happy lives, performing commerce, you know, uh, creating value in these structures that he built. He didn't have to have any kind of reminder that his work mattered. Because it just obviously did. Now, what I noticed when I started paying attention to this factor, does my work matter, sometimes, sometimes I knew that it did. You know, especially a crisis comes up and, uh, you know, you're the person with the information to get the system back online. Does your work matter at that moment? Yeah, yeah, you have a pretty good sense that it matters. But there's other times when you're not quite sure. You're working on a feature and you're not convinced that anybody's ever gonna, excuse me, ever gonna use this feature. Ooh, now I'm just a little bit ill at ease. Or even things like refactoring. You know, I got some ugly code and I clean it up and it looks beautiful. Did that matter? I felt good while I was doing it Yes, but did it matter? There's more beauty in the world. Uh, okay, but did it really matter? So I am now in the habit, when I am at the least bit unsure about whether my work matters, to go and find out. I'm going to go and ask questions. I'm going to perform experiments. I'm going to measure stuff to make sure that my work matters. The, I, let's see, three billion seconds is uh, 95 years more or less. So that's, uh, given how far we've all gotten, we're likely to make that, probably as likely as not to make that. So three billion seconds, uh, like half of mine are gone. And every second another one disappears. I wanna make sure that I'm doing something that's important with every one of those seconds because you can't get them back. So, practically speaking, this kind of looks like lean startup stuff, if necessary. You know, I'm building some feature, some big feature, 
And uh, I'm not sure that anybody's ever going to push the button that kicks off the computation that I've so carefully and lovingly crafted. Well, let's go find out. Is anybody, before I carefully and lovingly craft the function, let me go put a button in place and see if anybody clicks it. Now, this means that I do stuff out of order. I do things in a, in a sequence that maybe doesn't make sense from an engineering efficiency standpoint because I'm spending the first part of any piece of development reassuring myself that my work matters. Now, as I said, sometimes it's no different. So, sometimes, you know, somebody's uh, demanding a feature or, or uh, especially, here's the downside of working on, on consumer software, is your wife gives you bug reports. <laughs> which may take undue weight in the prioritization process. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> but if I get a request like that, and I know that I'm doing something that will, that will uh, contribute to familial harmony, I don't have a question about whether my work matters, so I can just go ahead and get to it. But when I feel that tickle in the back of my head that says, is this really? Is this really something that needs to happen? I'm going to invest the time to go and find out before I just, just dive in. Uh, here's one that I didn't even know was possible when I started programming. I was introduced to this model by a very large and successful 80s software company. The Jello model, have you heard of this? The way you pick the version to ship, to put on the CDs and ship out to millions and millions of people is software is like Jello, it's just always wiggling. And then as an engineer, you'll notice a moment when it appears to stop wiggling, and that's the version that you send out. <laughs> Come on. That was, the, that was the highest level of confidence that an engineer could aspire to is a lack of Brownian motion in gelatin. <laughs> to which I say, no, no, in fact, that nagging feeling that I have when I, I'm going home at night and I'm thinking, God, did that really work? That's a choice. I can choose to work. Again, it requires me shuffling, you know, instead of doing the testing way at the end, blah, 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 I say, take some of that testing and I put it a little bit before. And then it kicks off large controversies and video chats with people all over the world and stuff. Uh, no, no, that's not the point. Where exactly you put the testing, but what is the point is, I need to know that my code works. I need to feel confident. If I don't feel confident that my code works, I should work in a different way. And there's a wide variety of, of different workflows that result in much more confidence than I ever imagined possible when I got started in this. But I can choose to work in that style. And whether you do TDD or somebody came up to me and said, oh, I don't like doing unit tests. That's fine. Like, first, it's your code, it's not my code. <laughs> but, but second, it, like if it doesn't help, don't do it. If it does help, do it. Like, how, how complicated is this conversation, actually? <laughs> But whatever, if you're confident that your code works, then ship it. And if you're not confident that your code works, then get confident that your code works, and then ship it. You can, like, I can do that. 
And if I do that, when I, when I do that, when I choose to do that, like sometimes I panic, oh, I'm in too much of a hurry to feel confident. Like that's gonna help, but I do it. But when I do it, when I say, well, no, let me make sure that I feel good about this going out. That's another one of those consumer products things, like when you have a bug, it's a big bug. And uh, that can be very instructive but fairly embarrassing. So I want to know that my code works before it goes live. And I can do that, and when I do that, I feel at ease. That level of anxiety just drops that much more. My feeling of facility and mastery, like this code works. If I want to make this change, then yeah, I think Here's, what, here's the small increment that I'll do that makes sure that my code still works. That's a, that's a great feeling to know that the next feature is one step away. We're not robots. I realize that shouldn't be news, but a lot of the engineering management wisdom, best practices, there's a phrase that I hate, having put it on my first book, <laughs> treats engineers as robots. Like, here we're in some process, and da 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 and we ship it, and where's the celebration? Where's the acknowledgement that we're social beings, much as we hate that? Where's like, this is, humans are doing this, and one of the basic human needs is a need to feel proud of what you do. This is a big part of, of my motivation uh, for refactoring. This is something that pushes my refactoring a little bit earlier. Now, as time has gone on, I refactor later and later and later. It's getting close to the just in time, just before I need to make some change, then I refactor to make that change easy, and then I make the easy change. But uh, it's, a, it's a choice. And that feeling of pride in the work that I do is something that when I actively pursue it, I feel better about what I do. I am more at ease. I have more of that sense of accomplishment, more of that, the lack of worry and anxiety, because I'm like, yeah, this code's as good as it makes sense to make it right now. Cool, yeah, I'm proud of what I did. Now I can share it with somebody else, and away we go. I was taught that this was not an issue early on in my career. Like, it just doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if it even works as long as you have plausible deniability with respect to the QA department. <laughs> You're good. I feel, I feel terrible about doing this. Stop feeling terrible. Everybody acts this way. Well, yeah, everybody did. And it wasn't a lot of fun. But there were people, though, I certainly ran into people who, for whom that wasn't good enough. And fortunately for me, it gave me good examples of working on a system until you feel pr proud of it. So those emotions, those emotions are valuable information. Emotions are noisy information, but they're valuable information. And that feeling of, I'm proud of this, means something. And that feeling like, oh, I hope nobody ever looks inside this file, that also means something. And uh, learning to figure out when it means you should go and fix something up before shipping versus fixing it up after shipping versus just getting over it, that's the work. That's why 10 years later I'm still working on this stuff. But that feeling of pride and pursuing the feeling of pride in my work, that's something that puts me more at ease in the, in the work that I do.
I do a lot of coaching these days, bright young engineers, and one of the skills that I teach actively is uh, learning to trust your own sense of curiosity. I say ideas are like little mice. And uh, there's, a, there's a hole over on the wall, and the idea is just going to poke its nose out and see if it's safe, safe to come out. And if, if I, at that moment, say, oh, come out. Yeah, come on out here. Let's, we can talk. And it's safe, then the, the mouse comes out and we can have a little conversation, and then it goes back in and it tells all the other mice, is cool, he feeds you corn and stuff. <laughs> but, but, if the little mouse sticks his nose out, and wiggles his uh, whiskers, and you go, get out of here, I don't have time for you, then that idea pops back in there and tells all the other little mice ideas, forget it, man, it is not worth going out there, nothing's gonna happen. And maybe six months into my now four years at Facebook, I had a real crisis where I had lost my self-confidence and I get these ideas and I go, oh God, somebody's, somebody's certain to have thought of that already. Or I have another idea, I'm like, oh, I, I probably don't have time to, to follow that up. I, I was so mean to the mice, they just stopped showing up. And I don't like that. I, I like being an idea fountain. Uh, and so I decided to consciously um, encourage my own ideas. Now, it didn't mean that I ran off and spent five years following each idea. But a, an idea would pop out, and I'd just think, oh, well, I wonder if that's true. Here's some hypothesis about uh, software development. Let me see if I could find some data. I'll take a half hour. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I'll take a half hour to figure out if the data supports this hypothesis. And lo and behold, the more of that I did, the quicker I was at, at vetting these ideas as they came out, and the more ideas came pouring out. You know, which is a little bit of a challenge when you've got ideas popping out all the time. You have to figure out how to be supportive of your ideas without spending all of your time just going from one thing to the next to the next. That's a big motorcycle. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, so last night I went, uh, I wonder if uh, Rails is structured more or less like all the other repos that I've ever looked at. If we looked at uh, the number of commits by committer, are we going to end up with this power law distribution uh, the way we usually do? So lo and behold, yes. Short answer, yes. There's like, I don't remember the exact numbers. 3,000 people who've committed to the Rails repo once, and a third that many that have committed two or three times, and a third that many that have committed uh, four through seven times, and then it goes, then the slope changes about half, 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 half. And then this one is interesting because there are, Aaron, you win, by the way, for the moment. Uh, DHH, up your game. <laughs> I mean, I'm an outsider here, so I can say these things. <laughs> it is unusual. Usual, it's unusual to see this, this uh, the fat tail have five people in it the way it does. Usually there is one person who commits way more than everybody else in these kinds. But, so that's kind of interesting to me that there's, this, that there, there's a number of people who've committed a lot to Rails. Um, but this was just like late at night, oh, I wonder, I've looked at a lot of repos and almost all of them look exactly like this, by the way. The, Ra the Ruby one looks completely bizarre, by the way, so if somebody, if a Ruby committer could 
talk to me about it. I would love to find out more about it. Um, but this was just an idea that popped up. Half an hour later, I had a graph. I could put it in. And now the next time, one of those little mouse ideas, one of those mouse hypotheses about, oh, I wonder if we really don't use very many estimates in our development, pops its, its head out. It's more likely to come out to where I can see it and encourage it, try out a little bit of time. And the connection with ease. Here's the problem for me when, I, when I'm scaring the mice back into the walls all the time. I just feel terrible. I know that there's this whole world of things that I could explore, that I could learn about, and, and I'm just blowing them off because I'm so focused and so busy doing this one thing that I have no slack to, to pursue other ideas. That, that's a terrible moment for me. And that conscious choice to begin encouraging my own ideas made a huge, huge difference in my sense of ease at work. This was a, a surprising one. Maybe I should subtitle this talk, How I Got Over What I Learned the First 10 Years I Was Programming. Because this is another one, as a young programmer, I was told, never give an estimate. Uh, and if you have to give an estimate, uh, uh, like maybe make an estimate for when you'll have the estimate ready, and then try and bury any numbers that you produce so deep that nobody ever figures out to find them. And you can't ever be called to account. That's the, the next one. And I learned quite the opposite. Now, uh, estimates for finishing features, I think, is a lose. But that's a much longer conversation. But you don't have to estimate how long it'll take you to do a widget in order to make a public commitment. You can make public commitments towards shared goals. OK, I think we can increase revenue by 10%, or I think we can uh, reduce uh, churn in our users by 3%. And on this date, we're going to measure and see if we actually did that. Now, the first time I did this, I was terrified because it was completely against all of my training. Don't say anything. And say things as vaguely as possible and don't attach dates. And if you have to attach dates, set them way far in the future or like tomorrow so you're absolutely certain it's something. Like this is the opposite of that. No, we'll make public commitments. When I do make public commitments, I immediately feel better. Oh, look, I got all these mice in the walls. It's actually a pretty accurate mental picture for me. I got all these mice in the walls. And when they come out, if I have one of these public commitments, I know how much time and energy to give them, a little bit. I, enough to encourage them, not discourage them. But I have this public commitment to make. And if this idea is tangential to that, then I'm going to do something else. I'm going to get back on track and do what I'm doing. Immediately, my anxiety level goes down. My sense of purpose and focus goes up. It is a little scary because I might not meet my commitments. When I do that, another scary technique for me that I found is just being accountable. So that means to be accountable means that you render account to someone else. OK, so you said the churn rate was going to go down to 14% and is still at 18%. What happened? OK, pre, this is the early young Kent would say, well, uh, servers were down, and these people did, didn't deliver the thing, and the blah, 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 blah. That's not what I'm talking about. Because immediately, I'm like, well, what if they point the finger at me? What if they blame me for this? Huh? If instead I'm accountable, I render account, I did this experiment, I did that experiment. 
I wasted two days uh, pursuing this idea that I really should have known better than to do. That's scary to just go, yeah, part of it was I just screwed up. Oh, hmm. But as soon as I make that commitment to myself that I'm just going to be accountable, huh, it just feels so clean. Because I know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to blame anybody else. I'm not going to point any fingers. I'm only going to say, here's what I did. Here's the decisions I made. Here are the activities. This is the account. Here's the accounting. This is how I spent the time. And now somebody else's response to that is their response, right? They can, they can be angry. They can, they can be depressed. They can say, well, let's work on this. They can have an idea, whatever. Somebody else's response, though, is their response. The part I can choose that puts me at ease is choosing to just be accountable. Here's what I did. This, this, this. Which leads to uh, the next habit that contributes to ease for me, which is interpreting feedback. Uh, I have the tendency to take on, well, it's either one of two things. Either when somebody says about me something good or something horrible, I think that's about me, or I just ignore them. And, and I kind of swing between these two poles, generally speaking, neither of which is a very good place to be. So uh, this habit of interpreting feedback contributes to my ease because you can come up to me and say, can't your, you know, your book saved my life? And I'm going to interpret that. I'm not going to think, I'm awesome. Because I'm no more awesome the moment after you said that than I was the moment before you said that. Right? Nothing's changed about me, but you just told me this story about, you know, reading a book and it was, and it made a huge difference to you. So I interpret the feedback. What a part of that is about you? Oh, you had this great experience. Well, I didn't read the book for you. You read the book for you. I didn't apply it. You applied it. So... There's a, I can take credit for this much. I wrote a book. I did the best job that I could when I was writing the book. And then there's this whole big bunch of it that's really about you and the stuff that you did. And that keeps me on an even keel because then the next person comes up to me and says, can't your books suck? I tried to apply them, and I got fired, and I was a homeless tango dancer. <laughs> this happened to me. This tango dancer? Well, did, did I, like, you know, the immediate reaction is, oh, you know, like, how can I get you off the tango floor? <laughs> but if I just remember this habit. Oh, I'm going to interpret this. I got some feedback, but I'm going to interpret it. What is that? What of that is about me? Well, who knows why you got fired? I hope you didn't just get fired because this would be really depressing if you did. Could you like nod or something? Okay, we're good. We're good. I'm going to help him find a job after this. I can interpret this feedback. I can say, okay, well, I wrote the book. Is there something that I could have done better? Certainly true. Is there a lesson that I can learn for the next book? Maybe. But most of that experience is your experience. It's not my experience. So that moment of interpreting feedback keeps me off of this, in the memorable phrase of a former Apple employee, keeps me off of the genius shithead roller coaster. Just that one habit. Well, let me interpret this feedback. This is the dumbest idea I ever heard. Well, you must not have been listening very well. Because this is certainly not the dumbest idea I've ever said. (laughs) 
That moment of interpreting feedback puts me at ease even in situations of conflict, which generally speaking I hate. But if I can remember to interpret, I can do closer to my best in that situation. Something else that I do that contributes to my feeling at ease is periodically become a beginner at something. So I perform in our local uh, production of the Nutcracker Ballet. And if you want something that will make you and your 50-year-old body feel stupid, it's do ballet for the first time. <laughs> Guaranteed. I, I learned Haskell a couple years ago. It's absolutely antithetical to everything that I believe about programming languages. <laughs> I learned really valuable lessons. I think about types in a completely different way than I had before. But, you know, does it feel good to be a rank beginner when you're used to really understanding your tools? No. It feels dislocated and, and confusing and you keep trying to grab onto the walls and the teacher keeps smacking your hand and pushing you out into the middle and you keep falling down. It doesn't feel good in the moment, but I can remember that feeling and I can get confidence like, oh, I'm in a situation, I'm not comfortable, I, I don't feel any sense of mastery, but it's okay. I can get out of it. If I could learn about Haskell, I can certainly deal with this situation. And away we go. So I consciously put myself in positions where I'm a beginner so that I feel uncomfortable, so that I can remember that I can deal with the feeling of being uncomfortable and still do a pretty good job. Uh, this last one is a, a, a habit that I've picked up, and I'm, uh, I, this is not about any kind of religion or pushing any particular thing, but something. Do something like this sort of direction. Uh, when I meditate in the mornings, I am one breath away from being okay for the rest of the day. And uh, I suppose the inverse is true. When I, when I, you know, I'm too busy to, to do anything in the morning, I'm one breath away from complete and utter panic for the rest of the day. So this is just something that's uh, made it a habit and it, it's made a big difference for me. The last of these techniques is this sense of service. There is something that happens to my brain when I do something for someone else in a way that prevents me from getting any kind of reward or feedback or props or anything. If I just do something for somebody else with no thought of, of anything coming back to me, I just feel better. I am more at ease with myself. I've been blessed. I have the chance to do this. And when I take a little bit and just put it out into the world, I feel better. I'm more at ease. The, the next thing that comes up in, a, in the work world, uh, I'm going to be uh, readier to take on. And so uh, that concludes my list of, uh, of things that I do to, to put myself at ease. Now, I'm going to skip these slides about getting uh, the short answer there is, if you wanted to start working on one of these yourself, find a buddy and work on it together with somebody. It makes a huge, huge difference. So one night, the farmer wakes up in the middle of the night. I told you I'd get back to it. You don't trust me. <laughs> he wakes up in the middle of the night, and the wind is blowing, and the rain is pouring down. And uh, the farmer gets up in a panic. He pulls on his boots and his pants, and he runs out to the barn. And the, uh, the, the farm helper's out there in the barn. And the farmer says, uh, we have to get the hay in so that it doesn't get ruined in all this rain. And the helper says, it's already been taken care of. 
And the farmer says, oh, we have to gather the cows in so they don't spook and, and stampede and all kill themselves. And the, the farm helper says, it's already been taken care of. Oh, we have to shut the shutters so that the rain doesn't come pouring into the barn. It's already been taken care of. And the farmer thinks a second and turns around and goes back into the house, goes upstairs, gets undressed, climbs under the covers. He tells his wife, well, it was all taken care of. And the wife says, now do you know what he meant by, I can sleep when the wind blows? That's what I wish for myself and for all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>